Our final speaker today uh, is a gentleman uh, who has been a lecturer at De Montfort University, Leicester, for over 19 years. Um, he has specialised on forecasting uh, and innovation um, and has also lectured a lot about future trends. So I just want to have a chat with him for 15 minutes or so, just so we can talk a little bit about the changing retail market, which hopefully is going to be really important food for your guys. We're not necessarily giving you answers, but the idea is to leave you with food for thought on how the retail environment is changing. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome James Woodhausen. I see, James. James, good afternoon. Afternoon. Um, love the name, by the way. It doesn't sound very uh, Birmingham or, or Midlands. Has M it got a bit of a Dutch connection? My dad had a little quarrel with the Nazis. Ah, uh, OK. <laughs> OK. Well, we'll, uh, we'll let that one go. Um, James, uh, I mentioned in my introduction, uh, you, uh, you've been a lecturer at um, De Montfort University, Leicester. Um, the title sounds amazing. The only problem is I don't quite understand it. Can you just summarize it very briefly for us? Well, predictions are very difficult, especially about the future. Um, we well, didn't get that one either, but never mind. <laughs> um, so it's just looking at the future of technological innovation, not just IT, important though that is, but all the other things that your excellent speakers have uh, talked about. How fast it will really happen? Do we buy the hype? Uh, and really down home stuff. I love, I love the discussion today about materials and. Uh, all of that aquaplaning, all very important. So I, I've learned a lot this afternoon. You've had some great speakers. Great. So we've uh, educated you as well. That's, that's not bad for a, for a lecturer. So, James, I want to talk now very specifically, if I may, about the retail market. Uh, we've heard a lot today about uh, the changing consumer, uh, how the consumer is much more informed, much more uh, information at their fingertips. Um, but... All of these people, or the majority of the people in this room, are retailers. Uh, they deal with this commodity called tyres. Uh, it's not necessarily the most sexiest of products, and yet all of a sudden, Xavier's put a very different light on. Suddenly, it has a, a very different feel about it going forward. But we call this um, area distress purchase. So can we talk about the retail environment from a pricing point of view? What's your view on that? Well, I think... Uh there's a lot of pressure on prices, and I, I think the forecast of up to 2% inflation that we saw earlier, probably, if you take the December figures, it's 0.5%, and could even go to uh, deflation. So people are going to be very, very price conscious, and the question is, do you have the confidence that your staff can actually themselves haggle over prices? We may be exiting the era of fixed prices, and of course haggling has a bad reputation, but uh, it may be something that the, uh, the tyre buyer coming in with a sheaf of notes from the internet, like so many of us do when we go and see our GP. In the US, it's 57% of people go to their GP having studied it all and know better uh, <laughs> than the GP. They're going to know a lot. You know, they're really going to know a lot. So the question is, will your staff know even more? Will they be able to move around the tablets and the, the customer's mobile and all of these things saying, well, you think you've got the cheapest price, but I'm telling you our price is even lower, and, and what do you say to a further 5% reduction? One has to have a lot of confidence in staff uh, to do that, and therefore staff training and their abilities in maths and all of these things, very important. So one tip, I mean... 3.14159265358979323834. What's, what's that, Ron? I don't know. It sounds very impressive to me. Well, it's pi to 20 places. Marvelous. If you get it wrong, you've got a square tire. So, you know, commanding those sorts of numbers, I'll see what I can do later, uh, you know, it's going to be very important. So, James, I think in summary then, what in that particular point, you're saying the front of house person that we currently employ may have to be a slightly different sort of person going forward, a uh, bit more knowledgeable, certainly a little bit more techy. They probably are in their own social lives anyway, but a very different sort of person if you start to look two years, five years ahead. Yeah, I think their interpersonal skills, their eye contact, their posture, 
the command of the mass, the command of the competition, the command of the prices, and also we're going to see more volatility in prices. I don't know if you've been mm -hmm. looking at your mobiles, I'm sure nobody did uh, this afternoon, but the oil price has just gone up and down two or three dollars given events in Saudi Arabia today. So, you know, it, it, at the moment it's fifty dollars a barrel, it could go up to a hundred dollars a barrel in 18 months. Certainly over the next five to ten years, or what I want to talk about this afternoon, you're going to see some big changes up and down, and we've got to keep abreast of all that. Absolutely. Um, we talk a lot about the consumer being a lot more informed, and we've, we've spent a lot of time talking about that today. And obviously the, uh, the fact that we all have smartphones or, or mobile devices, um, how do you see that impacting? I know we've talked from a consumer point of view, but you see just perhaps slightly differently. Well, I think Ben was uh, on the nail when he talked about how mobile phones and also tablets have risen in terms of use compared with the, the, the fixed line uh, desktop. I think there's four things that you need to be aware of. Uh, what you can do to not just allow uh, your website to be adapted to mobile, that's important, but to make mobile actually the prime means of displaying your ideas and your content and your mm. pricing information to people. Mobile is, must be first, and that means a whole di new discipline in website design. Uh, ben already referred to the fact people don't scroll down. There are four things you can do. The first of them is uh, location, location, location. How good is your mobile website to find you and to map the process of getting to you? We heard about fuel maps. How are they going to get you? What are the traffic conditions going to be like? And um, how do they recognize you? The second thing is that the, you need to have some clickable links on your website, on the mobile, that will feed through to a customer service call. So I click on that, I get one of your representatives. Then we need to think also about how we visualize all the data that we've seen uh, today in this compressed format. And that means the sort of charts, the colors, and the simplicity that you go for is very important. I, d I took the liberty of looking at Ryanair's site in 2006. We know they've had a makeover. You see it in 2006, it looks like somebody's just been rather ill. Uh, you know, they, it's all yellow and red. And one thing you might do to your website, mobile or fixed right now, how many typefaces are you using? Because, and, and get a graphic designer to look, because you're probably using like Ryanair did, mm -hmm. 12. Now you look at the Ryanair site with about three typefaces and it's all cleaned up. It's all people jumping up and down on beaches and it's, you know, Michael O'Leary's changed uh, and so has the website changed. So visualizing that data. What it all comes down to is making uh, your mobile strategy the first thing and also recognizing that you have a Samsung, I have an iPhone. So it's got to be what's called responsive design. It's got to respond to each kind of device that's out there, and there are many new kind, uh, kinds of devices launched every year. So it's a big responsibility. Yeah, very different way of looking at the whole subject of, of website development. But well, almost think mobile first is, is your point. Well, that's right, and indeed the way it's headed is wearable first. Now, there have been a lot of hype about that, and I, I'm convinced that the hype about Google Glass really is hype, because I learned just yesterday that Tesco is going to introduce Google Glass. Uh, it was not necessarily the kind of endorsement right now that you want uh, for Apple. But uh, if you look, just Microsoft's announcement just this week, the HoloLens, you know, Ron edited out uh, me talking about holograms, but I'm not going to let him get away with it. Uh, you know, m m Microsoft has got something that's uh, another headset. We, we don't, you've got enough head cases coming to your stores. You don't want any more headsets. But nonetheless, it's giving you augmented reality. So all the things that Sergio and your other Xavier speakers were talking about, you look at a tar and some new stuff yeah. is going to come up. So whether it's the Apple iWatch, the Google Glass, the Microsoft HoloLens, 10 years down the track, those wearables are going to be a significant yeah. part of the market. Yeah. yeah, very different, very different. Um, I want to move on, um, James, to the area of payment. Um, and by payment, I mean, you know, if you look back even 10 or 15 years ago, uh, there was payment with cash or you, the, the, the good old check. Uh, and now, of course, we all use plastic and it's, it's the norm. Uh, how many people say I no, no longer even carry cash? But what's your view on payments? How, what's your view and vision on that going forward? Well, 
Ben said that people have an attention span of just eight seconds. What was that you said, Ron? <laughs> uh, and uh, in fact, if you, uh, how many of you have heard of Zap? Oh, great. Well, it's nice to be ahead in the future just for a while. Well, Zap is going to be launched this year, and it's mobile payments courtesy of HSBC and lots of other people. And they reckon you can get out of the checkout situation in 12 seconds wow. with, their, with their new one. Now, you want to have a look at this quite carefully because a lot of players riding in the field there's Barclays, Pingit, there's about 12 startups uh, in the fintech um, system for financial technology that the government is nurturing in London. Uh, there are a number of other uh, deals being made, but the overall trend is what you refer to, right? Checks, can't remember the last time I wrote one. Uh, cash, it's around 53% of the volume of tr transactions at the moment. It's going down 1% a year. Not a whole lot, but by the time you add it, you know, 10 years ahead, that's right down to 40%. If you look at the value of the transactions, it's go, uh, gone from about 11.5 quid to 9.5 quid for a typical cash transaction now. Mm. Cash, unhygienic, uh, easily ripped off, all of these things. Of course, electrons can be hacked, but cash has many disadvantages. So that's just going down the tube. And if you can work out how many different uh, payment systems you need to satisfy maybe 90% of your customers. What the research by the Center for Economics and Business Research has shown, Douglas McWilliams, who's been on in the papers for another reason this last week, but we won't go into that. I like to stab a forecaster in the back. Uh, <laughs> you know, they, um, Douglas McWilliams, make sure you Google that. In double inverted commas will bring it up. Uh, <laughs> What you'll find is that, you know, um, they are predicting that just by 2019, the proportion of mobile-made retail sales will move from 9.5% to 19.5%. Wow. And that's in just four years' time. That's considerable. Right? Now, I, it's not often I agree with an opponent, uh, but on this occasion, I think it's right. And when you go 10 years, it's going to be 30 40%. And if I'm buying things just... Doing that, you know, the way I look at my emails, junk, junk. Oh, I like that. Oh, I like that. You know, you don't have to get it out and play with it and all of that. So speed of payment, you know, is going to be a critical factor for the, for the customer. Get out of the shop and, you know, stop it being distressed and get driving. So if, if we're not making it uh, almost the norm now for ease of payment, even in, even in our industry, the tire retailing industry, we could actually be seen as not being uh, in amongst it where it's all happening today. Well, that's right. Um, it, it, be careful here because, uh, you know, a lot of the startups are going to fail. Mm. And, and we also, in Europe, we're very good at chip and pin and all of that stuff. We've already got near field communications where you don't have to slot it in. So that's made startups a bit harder because we're more advanced than, say, America and everything. So be careful who you choose. But the CEBR research says that customers do not want to be told how to pay. They want to tell you how they want to pay. Mm. And if you can respond to that for most of the, most of the time, mm. uh, then you'll be winning and the word will get out. Good point. Good point. Um, as an industry, um, we've been very dominated um, by mail purchasing um, influences, let's say. Um, when you and I were talking on the phone a couple of weeks ago, you held again another different view on that, which we seem to have done a lot of over the last couple of weeks. But, uh, but in terms of talking about the male buyer or the male buyer influencing the female uh, purchaser, what's your view on that? Well, I'm delighted by the uh, growing and female composition of the audience, and I think that illustrates a point, which is, although we don't have equal pay yet in Britain, it's got a lot better over 30 years since mm. the Equal Pay Act. So women have more disposable income, but that isn't my main point. My main point is the expectations, including those among men, of the people who come into your shop are set by their wives taking them to buy things in supermarkets or in fashion or elsewhere. You know, it's women and mums who do the driving a lot of the time in the family. We heard about that yeah. from Joe. They're the ones who do the talking with great respect on, on mobiles and the, and the tweeting and all of that. I don't know how many men here, hands up the men here who watch Mums Net. Well, it's time, gentlemen. <laughs> They've had 40, they get 14 million hits a month right, uh, on Mums Net, and they got me hooked into it. 
right? And you might consider advertising there. So when the mum goes into Burberry, you might say, well, what's that got to do with me in the tar manufacturing, at the tar retailing business? And the answer is, well, because there's an ambiance, there's a customer service, there's the brains in the staff, there's the speed of the checkout, and the whole vibe is where they think retailing should be. And if they get a wholly different impression from the down-home business of tire retailing, they're going to pass it on, they're not going to go again, uh, and they're going to be influencing their husbands as well as to what, what to expect. Now, what does it mean for you all in terms of design? Hygiene has got to be important. Take a look at those doorknobs. Uh, carpets are going to be important, fascias are going to be important. The overall cleanliness, the loos, the uh, courtesy of the staff, without stereotyping women, they care about these things to do with environment and ambiance, and they also care about safety and all of those other things, perhaps more than men. So I've written a whole um, 17,000 word white paper, uh, Ron, on how is it that women are different from men. Oh, right. Some of the hows are fairly obvious, but there's some other ones, like why, uh, that, that are also very interesting. And I think it's a women's decade in front of us. You know, that's been the trend the last few years. Just for once, I'll extrapolate it. Okay, good. Interesting view. Inter I mean, we've always talked about making the retail environment a more pleasant experience. You know, the fact that we deal in what we call distress purchase products doesn't mean to say the environment has to reflect that. But I think your take on the, the female influence growing is something that I think is something that we really do need to take stock of. I think it's a valid point. Leads me on to um, another point that sort of derailed me when we were having a conversation. Uh, and uh, it was a phrase that uh, James gave me, which was um, when he talks about um, tire retailing, he said, let there be light. And I thought he was having an out-of-body experience or something. But what exactly do you mean by light? Well, I think it was biblical, actually. I know it was. Out of oh, okay. Uh, well, you know, the thing is, if you look at how much investment is going on here and, and how I'm sweating and, and how Ron looks so young and me so old, you can tell that, you know, light has a very big influence on your staff, the uniforms, the detail in the treads that they're seeing, all the rest of it, right? And the good news is that light-emitting diodes, LEDs, are not just for impressing you know, your friend with your dashboard, but uh, they are developing in a way that makes for a better quality of light, cheaper, keeps on in low temperatures, in sub-zero temperatures, starts immediately on light fluorescent lights, gives very good color rendition and contrast. So if you've got all these stories to tell about Goodyear Dunlop tires, then lighting will illuminate all of that. Mm. And will convey the kind of assurance and confidence you have in your environment and in your staff. Save you a lot of money, LEDs, because they're very energy uh, s savvy. You know, they use very little. And they last for 30,000 hours. So although you've got quite a heavy upfront investment, you're saving in terms of the durability of it all. So from the cost point of view, but especially from the customer point of view, you know, the, the gritty image of driving and where the rubber hits the road has to be complemented by something softer, very directional, high lights, low lights, and all of it will be stripped back, so not quite as obtrusive as And it. you are referring also to exterior Correct. lighting of premises? Just getting to that, yeah. yeah. The, I mean, night is where we're headed because it's becoming a more 24 our society gradually, you know, London isn't yet really a 24-hour city, to be frank about it, but people are working later, there's more calls to China, more to America, all of these, so night is where more and more business will be done, and that's where safety considerations come into play, especially for women, you know, you, if yeah. just if you, if you really had a distress purchase at 9 o'clock at night and your shop is open, it had better be nicely lit. If you look at Sainsbury's store in Leek, Scotland, they just installed a whole bunch of General Electric uh, LEDs there, and they're very pleased with it, I believe. So have a look at your forecourt, so to speak, and how you look at day and night, what you can do to save money and make the whole thing more welcoming, more inviting, and more palpably safe. Yeah, that's a good, in interesting view. Just one point, you mentioned about opening hours. Is that something that you think is also... We, I think a lot of our dealers are 
fairly traditional in terms of their opening hours. Some have extended Saturday and Sunday openings. But let's say, you know, we close at six o'clock and people are still traveling home. And do you have a view on opening hours? Well, it, it, uh, it's interesting you mentioned that. Um, in France, there's a major struggle going on right now about Sunday opening. You know, we had it yeah. back in, uh, in Britain. And, um, you know, I, I, I don't want to be Dickensian, but, I, you know, who can say I'll get, I mean, in London or Birmingham or anywhere, I'll be, I'll be at your premises by 6 o'clock tonight, mm. you know, on a Friday night or whenever it happens, because it's usually a Friday night, uh, certainly with washing machines. So, uh, you know, the, the well, nobody can say I'm definitely going to be there by mm. 6 o'clock, right? And unless one can extend those hours, pay the staff properly, light it properly, make sure people are, you know, conforming to regulations, um, you know, you're going to lose a lot of business. So I think uh, a more varied, uh, more consumer-friendly regime, that's what they're doing with GPs already. Mm. Right? You know, GPs yeah. are supposed to be, be there now, you know, mm. and, and not just clock off. So I think it's something we're going to have to get used to over the next 10 years. Absolutely. So, in summary then, uh, James, we, we, you've sort of made some headline statements. Uh, we're not necessarily giving all the solutions, but how would you sort of summarise this retail environment? Well, these are only questions, folks. I mean, I might be wrong. It's for you to test. And, that, uh, you know, I talk a lot about innovation. There's not enough R&D going on in the world today, even in the West. Car companies, not bad. IT companies, very good. Retailers very little is happening mm. right? yeah. and so you need to do better R&D than you're already doing open a file on all these payment systems get a young person on it or oh, younger than you I should say <laughs> uh, and you know m and try to get them to talk English about the different payment systems I think the key thing is only one person retailer can be the lowest price yeah. right Absolutely. and if you it, it, you know you, we could all get into a pure price war which mobile is going to accelerate because everybody's going to be going like that across that's over. That's headed for disaster potentially. Well, that's right. That's what Amazon has already done to the book trade and, and a lot of other trades, mm. right? Mm. So there's only one alternative to that, which is add value to the customer experience through innovation. And it can't be cosmetic innovation. It's got to be the real deal. So whether it's the demeanor and the, the, the intelligence of your staff and their maths and their following of uh, prices, or that whether it's the ease of use of your mobile first website, getting out in 12 seconds, making it a more congenial environment for, for women and especially harassed mums, and using lighting in a very savvy way, all of those things are adding value to this, you know, oh, I don't want to be here uh, thing. And they'll get the customer coming back three or four years down the track. So a lot of it is, let's say, obvious but sometimes it needs to be crystallized, and perhaps that's what we've done today. Yeah, I think uh, prototypes, pilots, mm. making mistakes, seeing what happened, some great stuff in the Harvard Business Review. I know we've all got problems, uh, but you know, make, if you uh, check out the Harvard Business Review, there's a great article on prototypes, experiments, how to design them. So you test this stuff, right? Because you're not going to get it right first time. Yeah. Move ahead like that, you'll be real innovative. That's great. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please join me in saying a big thank you to James Woodhausen. <laughs> James, thank you very much. Perfect.